Hello and welcome to this week's Macker to Macker. It's a delight to have you here in your living room and to welcome you in my living room. This idea of this series is to go from my living room to your living room, wherever you are, and to our guest living room, wherever they are. We've got a great Macker to Macker lined up for you tonight. We've got the wonderful Suzanne Bonner back with us again. And we've got Nadine Aisha Jassett with us for the very first time. And we've got Hannah Lavery. So it's going to be a really fantastic show. And I'm really looking forward to it. The idea behind Macker to Macker is to pass the baton on Macker to Macker. I'm the third modern Macker. The word Macker just means National Poet of Scotland. And I follow Liz Lockhead and Edwin Morgan. Had Edwin Morgan lived, he would have been 100 this year on the 27th of April. So we pass the baton, macker to macker, maker to maker, which is the nearest English equivalent of the word macker. But it doesn't apply exclusively to Scottish writers. Chaucer was referred to as a macker by Dunbar. Hannah Lavery is now living in Dunbar. <laughs> Just a wee joke for me to get us all kicked off. You know, I have to start with a bad joke somewhere. Anyway, I thought I'd start with this poem because we've got three wonderful women on the programme that are going to be talking about all sorts of different things, inheritance, resilience, storytelling, families, baggage, the past, where we're from. And I thought just for uh, Gay Pride Month, I would read this particular poem because I know it's going to be follow followed by the wonderful Suzanne Bonner singing Miss Seeley's Blues. This is called Her. I had been told about her, how she would always, always, how she would never, never. I'd watched and I'd listened, but I still fell for her, how she always, always, how she never, never. In the small, brave night, her lips, butterfly moments, I tried to catch her and she laughed, a loud laugh that cracked me in two. But then I had been told about her, how she would always, always, how she would never, never. We too listened to the wind. We too galloped apace. We too up and away, away, away. And now she's gone, like she said she would go. But then, I had been told about her, how she would always, always. So I always like to kick things off with a, with a small offering for me, but now we're going to have an even bigger offering from Suzanne Bonner. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> nice to see you again. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to welcome into the Zoom room for now, Nadine Aisha Jassett. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> And I'm going to welcome into the Zoom room, Hannah. Oh, Hannah, Hi. Really, really, really lovely to see you. Um, fantastic. So Suzanne, it's, it's really great to have you again. Suzanne's a wonderful, wonderful singer and an actress. She's had many, many accolades for, for her work. She first broke on to the scene with the whistly title, Fly Me to Danoon, and she followed that up not that long later with an extraordinary documentary about finding her father who she'd been estranged from for two years for years since she was two I was going to say not for two years but since she was two <laughs> and and she went to South Carolina and uh, reconnected with with the family there which was an extraordinarily moving experience and for that documentary she won a number of different war awards and the theme of, of of fathers and and losing them or trying to understand them connects uh, all of us in various different ways, which we'll hear about a little bit later as the show goes on. Um, but for now, Suzanne, who's just got the most amazing voice, it will blow you away if it's your first time to Macker to Macker. A huge welcome if it's your second, third, fourth, fifth time to Macker to Macker. An even bigger welcome. Let's give it up for Ms. Suzanne Bonner. Hey. <laughs> I'd like to sing a song, it's from The Colour Purple, and it's called Miss Seely's Blues. Sister, you've been on my mind. Whoa, whoa sister, we're two of a kind. Sister, I'm deep in my eye. 
all of you. I bet you think that I know nothing but singing the blues. Whoa, whoa, sisters, have I got news for you? I'm something. I hope you think that you are something too. Ooh, yeah. Struggling, I've been up a lonesome road. I've seen a lot of sun going down. Oh, but trust me, no low life gonna run you around. So let me tell you something. Sister, remember your name. No, oh, Twister, don't let them steal your stuff away. My sisters, we sure ain't got no lot of time. Hey, hey, hey. Struggling, I've been up that lonesome road. I've seen a lot of sun going down. Oh, but trust me, no low life gonna run you around. Well, let me tell you something, sisters, remember your name, no twister, don't let them steal your stuff away, my sisters, we sure ain't got no whole lot of time. Come on and shake your shimmy, sisters. Cause honey, tonight, I am feeling just Oh, that was just, just fantastic. And that's from the color of purple, isn't it? That's yes. to do with Shu Gavery's absolute um, obsession and feeling completely in love with Miss Seely, which I remember is one of the first kind of lesbian love affairs that I ever came across in literature way back in the 1970s when I first yes. read that book. Alice Walker. I love Alice Walker. Fantastic writer. Yeah. And uh, did you did you pick that song for any particular reason tonight, Suzanne? Well, I just thought uh, when I was you know looking at the work of uh, the combined work of of, um, of us all, I thought it'd be nice to do a song that kind of speaks a lot about connection, ancestry, women. A song for women. Um, it's a good song for humankind, and we've got to remember to support our women and and children to make this world a much safer and better place. So I thought it would be a good choice to do. <laughs> and of course to celebrate gay pride as well <laughs> yeah yes because lots of people um that were hoping to celebrate gay pride in a particular way have had to take to doing things like this on the zoom room instead of marching and it's uh yes there's, there's all sorts of different things been happening really inventive things and and perhaps it's actually involved some people that wouldn't have been able to get to the big cities to march anyway perhaps it's been more inclusive for people that are in rural areas or on islands uh, to feel really properly included uh, in Gay Pride this year. Yes, I hope so. I like that idea. <laughs> the island flags flying. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm always planning to take the folks with me to the sky, you know. <laughs> That's it, you know. Just, just all arrived, just all arrived. 
all the sisters, all the sisters arrive in Sky and then write a poem about it. I think that would be that would be just utterly fantastic. <laughs> Singing rhinestone cowboy, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my that's my kind of fantasy. But talking about sisters, let me let me um, reintroduce to you or introduce to you properly, Nadine Aisha Jassett. It's uh, lovely to have you back in the Zoom room. Hey, Nadine. Hi. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome to Macker to Macker. You'll, you'll find that I say that as often as possible, just for fun. <laughs> it pleases me. I'll get everybody saying it too, so as everybody will know the word Macker <laughs> by the I'm end so of this. I'm so excited. By the end of this. <laughs> oh, great. Well, well, Nadine, you're 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 really multi-talented because you're known for your for your poetry. And let me tell me, this was a huge hit. You published by a small independent press 404 Inc but they were just um, wonderful and it really really took off didn't it and you've done a lot of work with social justice and women you've been picked um, as part of the British Council's literary showcase by moi and, <laughs> and you've been picked by many other other people besides and your work it combines interest really in heritage resilience storytelling the fabrics of our lives the intricate and interwoven fabrics of our lives. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your very first set. Take it away Nadine. Thanks Jackie and thank you so much for having me on Maka to Maka. I will keep getting those words in as well um, and thank you Suzanne for just a beautiful way to start the evening. Just wonderful. Um, so I thought I wanted to start with my set with a mix of old and new poems so I thought I'll read two new poems and one from Let Me Tell You This. So I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote about libraries and about when I was a wee kid, um, you know, I was the child who was on the first name basis with the local librarian. And I read all the way through the teen section, all the way through the young people section, and then I ended up on crime for some reason. Um, but, you know, I think if the birth of the writer is in being a reader, I think for me, part of that journey then was at the root of my local library. So I wrote this poem called Prayer as part of a series for Wasafiri magazine and it's after a poem by Safar Kanail. Prayer. My first words were prayer. Lips pressed against the wooden shelf of the council library in my hometown. I blew and watched the pages murmur. I always marveled how air moved from an inside of me I couldn't see, up, out. At home, exhalations were clouds, nimbus coming down. But here, in my local library, my breaths, still to be written, waited patiently as I rested my chin on the shelf. And so a short and sweet one to begin with. But I like this idea and this memory of myself, you know, chin rested on the bookshelf at my local library where I grew up um, and how influential that was to me, you know, how influential access to books was for me. Um, so, and even when I see, let me tell you this out and about, for me, I'm never more excited than when I see it in a library and when I see it, you know, with the library barcode, because that's how I would have accessed it. You know, when I was younger, I would have accessed it in the library. So I thought I will read a poem from Let Me Tell You This to follow. Um, so I'm going to read Hopscotch, which I think is at the heart of the collection for me. So Let Me Tell You This, as you can tell from the title, is about voice and it's about speaking back to lived experience. It's very much about my own personal experiences. Um, and Hopscotch was a poem which I wrote about all the different words that men were saying to me on the street, you know, just, just random people as I was walking through living my life. And I kind of collected all these words together, words which made me feel silenced often and push them back and sort of say to the reader in the poem, you know, these are the words that I'm living with. Let me tell you what that's like. So this is Hopscotch. All right, tight pants, he says to me, I am 16. I like the way you wear that piece. I am 23. Nice puss. I am not a cat. Yowza, hey, beautiful. Isn't she gorgeous? Stunning. Bollywood, babe, I want you. 
I'm sat on the bus with a stranger's hot breath. I want you. I can still feel his heat in my ear when I hear a sexy, pretty, beautiful fist stuck up, bitch. I'd give her one. What's wrong? Can't you take this? It's just a compliment. Where's your boyfriend? What's your name? Darling eyed. <laughs> no. Has anyone ever told you you look like that celebrity? Has anyone ever told you you're beautiful? Has anyone ever told you they don't stop telling me? They're paving my streets with cobbles. Are you Spanish? Are you Greek? Do you speak Iranian? Oh, you're just another sunbed addict. No, I'm tripping as I walk on, but your hair, but your eyes, but your skin, but you don't look Scottish. And where, where, where are your family from originally? How I wish, how I wish I had your tan. Is your dad in the Taliban? You should go back home now, go back home, go back to where, your mum. Your mum's a packy lover. I was 14. Slut. She was 43. Slag. This isn't just me. These words, they're like Tuesdays. And it's one every week. And I've held them between pressed palms and yellow locks. I have consulted them like a guidebook to my own hometown, hench them hard in fingers that now mark the imprint of nameless men trying to name me. I stare hard at hands and fists and feet, don't walk, don't look, don't think, don't be that key in my hand turning a lock in my throat, don't feel another man's teeth as I walk these streets of you and me, yet I exist. I exist somewhere between, are you Asian and nice tits and let's just name the problem here. These streets I've walked, I've walked in fear. And never once have these words begun in a woman's mouth. Still, I am leaving them here. So I like to play with voice in my work, in my prose work, in my poetry. Voices are something that's, that's really important. And in, in Hopscotch, I think that poem's about a journey to reclaiming voice against the voices which try silence you, which is so key to let me tell you this. And then recently in lockdown, I guess the way that I've been navigating voice has been the distance between me and the voices of the people I love and how remembering their voices and, and writing about their voices can keep them close to me. So in February, I was in Zimbabwe with my auntie, my dad's family from Zimbabwe, and I was with her and she's been one of the defining figures of my life and her voice is a part of me. So I wrote this poem about her and it's called My Aunt Says Yes. My aunt has different ways of saying yes. There's the exactly hey when she is in passionate spirits, usually about some social etiquette another has failed to achieve. There's yes, you see, which belongs to the same tree and can be extended to things such as political commentary. There's, yes, we are, usually followed by good girls or butternuts and shortly accompanied by a laugh or a smile. There's, yeah, right, said slightly softer or, yes, that is also okay, said when substituting a recipe of inspecting my crochet. There's G to the uncles, of course, when she agrees. Yes, please, sung to the supermarket clerk. Thank you, rung to anyone offering anything for free. There's, yeah, shame when something hurts me. And there's the way she goes quiet the day before I leave. And I wonder if it's because she'll miss me. Yes. And there's her hands clapping at the airport when I come home to her again. Yes, yes, yes. Thank, well, thank you, Jackie. You. Thank you, Nadine. I really um, I, I was moved by those. I particularly um, enjoyed, maybe that's the right word, the juxtaposition of those last two poems because it was as if the positive and wonderful yeses um, from, from your Zimbabwean aunt um, was an antidote really to, to all the various different no's uh, in, the, in the poem earlier, where you hopscotch, where you 
managed to kind of hop really from square to square of different insults, but in a very light footed, sure footed way where you get the sense that the poet is not going to let these insults get the better of her, that there's a real resilience, um, that every negative is countered with a positive. Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, I think there's something that I try and do in, in all of my work where it's sort of holding the hard things, you know, the painful things and difficult things in one hand, but kind of having that joy and that gentleness in the other and then, and then mixing them through the work. Um, but yeah, it means a lot to know that you hear the resilience in Hopscotch because I think it, it is there, you know, that's, although it's a, a poem made up of seemingly of other people's violent words, actually my voice is present throughout it saying this isn't okay you know I'm going to speak back to this. Yeah and how important do you feel it is with your writing to use your writing as a tool to speak back I mean do you see writing as a form of resistance in itself poetry your poetry? Yeah I think for me poetry has been a form of resistance but I guess on on two levels I think when I first started writing poetry I was writing it for myself um, so it was almost like a form of emotional resistance, you know, so when I, I can literally remember the moment of sitting down to write hopscotch, for example, and just feeling I was carrying the weight of, of these words. And I think with a lot of poems that were the heart of Let Me Tell You This, it's about writing stories out of silences, you know, writing stories out of what you're told to be silent about. And that, that is a personally healing, but also politically powerful form of resistance, because any stories that are silenced, in, in the context that we're working with, you know, like sexism, like racism, to give air to them and give, give space for them to be heard is, is a form of resistance. Yeah, and there's always that worry, isn't there, that if you write about something and if you use the language of it, if you use the language of insult, that language of insult comes onto your, your page, into your screen and into your mind, and it's how to counterbalance that. I think that's a, one of those contradictions, because on the one hand, you know, as a writer, you want to be open, um, but on the other hand, you don't want to give headroom to toxicity and to poison, and you don't want your mind to be full of it. So it's, how do you manage that, that contradiction? I think for me, it's about telling those stories that I need to tell, but not feeling that I am defined by those words that have been said to me. You know, that actually my voice is always the more powerful thing running within them and running through them. Um, and then, like I said, with the, the joy, I guess, that comes with it, you know, this, there can be so much pressure to only tell one, one side of your story or one version of it. And actually, when I look at, let me tell you this, you know, I see a book that is full of stories about love as much as it is about resilience and, and overcoming difficult things. Um, and sometimes I do find it quite amusing to myself that, you know, Hopscotch, I think it's one of my favourite poems. And I love that the opening line of it is, all right, tight pants, you know, <laughs> is that what we <laughs> need more of that in literary classics? Um, but for me, it's that, that awareness of the, the truth and the reality that's often difficult. But then with that poet's force, bringing in the, the beautiful and the meaning that elevates, it, that elevates it to that something more. And what started you? You said earlier that you got started writing, and when you started writing, you started writing from in, in one way. What was it that kind of provoked you into writing, or inspired you to write in the first place? Put into it. So I think there was a personal feeling of voicelessness, and then there was also a woman called Hannah Lavery. We might know her very well. <laughs> um, so I think from a personal level, I was writing stories that I needed to tell, and then by a a very interesting chain of events um, when I was working for um, a women's aid service I was invited to do a workshop by WIM in maybe many many years you know um, in that workshop and I'd always been a writer but I'd been like a secret writer and then in that moment of the workshop which Hannah had facilitated it was like actually maybe you don't have to be secret writer you know you can be open writer honest writer and let it grow yeah, it's wonderful that the moment really when people stop being secret writers and then become uh, open to other people is a fantastic, um, magical moment. And I'm going to invite back into the room because it seems a, a, a brilliant time to have her back, Hannah. Um, because, uh, hello, Hannah. And, and Hannah, um, Hannah Lavery, like, like uh, you, Nadine, is, is a writer who writes in a complex way 
about belonging and loss and bereavement and her past and and other people's past not just her own and uh, last the year before last the drift was a national theater of scotland production and it went down really really brilliantly it told the, an autobiographical an autobiographical or a semi autobiographical story of your life uh, didn't it hannah and it got very very well received you won a playwrights award for it and um, you've, you've won a, a workshop lab uh, for it with the playwrights trust and you've been a regular at now ricky as well and you're an absolutely stunning performer um of your own work as as well as a really interesting thinker so welcome thank you um it's been it's lovely to be here what an honor and uh yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Amongst all these wonderful women tonight, it feels a real joy and pleasure. So, thank you for inviting me. I wonder if you'd like to start us off with, yeah. with your your first poem, which is a new poem from just bang fresh out of the oven, really, from this yeah, year, two thousand and twenty. That's it. Yeah. So I'll um I will I will get started. So um yeah, this this poem is very very new, um and it's called. This again, 2020. I will meet you walking up my path in all these improvised masks of mine. I will meet you as you look in at my window again for my father. You have already claimed him, I will say. You wore out his heart with overwork. You beat him with his own promise. You overfed him with shame. You drowned him in trauma. You took him already, I will say. I will tell you to go with my raised fist, with my hands up on my bended knee. I will tell you to go simpering, slowly simmering. I will tell you to, with this endless hand washing, bile swallowing, with all this fight, all this education, all your educating, all this side step, shuffle, tight rope dancing, with all this, all this, all this, with all this, with all these, with these, with these tongue tied hands. Go, will you? Go. Um, so I'm going to read another new one um, called Empire, a word. Empire, a word. A word we attach to you. This child of the empire, this product of the time. Anglo hyphen Indian, Indian hyphen Jamaican, hyphen hyphen hyphen, that Latin, that Roman thing, that tikka masala thing, that half caste creole thing, who pen, who fen, that hyphen 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 thing. In your Scottish galley kitchen, where a round clock should have been, you hung a portrait of the Queen, slightly higher than the portrait of the Pope, the good Pope, the good Queen, looking down at you as you added in the chilli. Um, so, oh, getting lost in paper here. Um, I'm going to read two poems now that come from The Drift. So The Drift was a spoken word show that I wrote and was produced by the National Theatre of Scotland. Um, and I went on tour with it, anyway, it doesn't matter about that. And it was, um, I, the poems were collected in this book, Finding Sea Glass, it was published by Studio Barb. And I'm gonna read you two poems and just let them flow into each other. And they're called, You Were Mine to Carry, and then Scotland. And I probably should say at this point, there is swearing in this, so if um, feel free to mute me or to close your ears if you don't want to hear that, I will not be offended. Um, this is called You Were Mine to Carry. You were mine to carry with the burden you swaddled me in, the burden you handed to me with my rattle. 
that burden of that fucking rage, all that no belonging, all that you don't quite fit. A burden of their gaze that we shared, but my skin, it was lighter. A limbo under the colour bar for me, an almost slip into nationhood for me. You pass as white for me. You couldn't, no dad, really. You're kidding yourself in your Scotland top clinging to the roots of your Scottish family tree, comic, grotesque, walking your father's long white line of working men huddled in Edinburgh closes, and no matter how close they held you, or how prized, how loved a son, this mother country made you fucking exotic. And whilst you fought that futile fight for something more, all that fine rage, that early brilliance, that packed punch, a waste. The only damage that you managed to inflict was inflicted on your wives and your children, on me, on you too. You see, we inherit our family's trauma. Their degradation drip drops its way to us. Their stories weave their way to us in a Nancy's web in knots and helix. These ghosts, we carry broken bones on our backs. Dad, I will find you. I will unravel you from me. I will see you whole. To turn your sea glass in my hands. Not just my daddy monster. And you know that's a neat fit. But you wear it badly. And we, you and I. We know, Dad, okay, I know, I get it, I get it. Scotland, you're no mine. You are no his. And I don't want you. So go ahead, say I don't belong. With your sepia tinge cross eye, sweeping over all that swept away, blood stained, sweat stained sugar for your tablet, your macaroon, your rotten, gobby, greedy, thieving bastard, you set up all that shite and broken bones weeping. Poor me. Fuck you. I will dance jigs on your flags, blue and white, blue, white, and red. It does not matter. But you'll each answer for that, for making us complicit. Handing us whip and chain, an officer's coat, a civil service pen, a queen to love and lay me out. I love you with all your mountain time and your Korean and you can say I didn't belong to you. I go on, but I am limpet stuck on you so fuck you for no seeing one of your own. I will hear, I will spill here. My blood and your secrets bleed into you, root and earth, and you forever pagan will in the spill and the seep see all you really are. So fuck you, my sweet forgetful Caledonia. We love. I fuck you. Well, I find that so powerful. I have heard you read that before at the National Theatre Scotland's launch to their new season, and I find it really powerful then and now. I really find the mix of it totally fascinating. The the speaker in it being in love in a way with mm. with their country, totally tenderly in love, and at the same time utterly wretched and disappointed at not being included in the way that um, that she wants to be. And that kind of uh, contradiction or paradox really runs through that whole poem and the and the one that you read, read before it. And it seems to me that you deal so tenderly with contradictions because in the earlier poem um, about your dad, you, you're, you're trying to unravel him, you're trying to understand him and the ways in which he's been uh, rejected by Scotland and, and, and he wanted to claim Scotland. He was different in, in that sense to, to, to um, well, diff wanted to claim Scotland differently, I should say, um, to, to the way that you want to. And um, so I find that really interesting in the fact that you've uh, read them as a pair, um, back to back like that. There's so much to unpick and unravel. And just the idea that as a, as a child, you should try to understand 
a violent man and to kind of realize that some of some of what he could have been has been taken from him and therefore taken from you well, i think i mean yeah i mean for me the the whole writing of the drifts came out of that well it came out of grief and it came out of trying to understand somebody that you that you could no longer um get any sort of closure from so really i kind of felt like it was a continuing of a conversation and i think for me as i began to unpack him it was hard it was almost impossible not to start looking at what that was for him to grow up in scotland and what that ev you know that kind of insidious everyday racism does to somebody's dignity and 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 the way in which they then father and become and try and claim their own sense of of being a man or being a and and, and the how that was so brutalized and and then that gets that has a sort of legacy to it so i think it it was coming from that place and i think i'm really glad that you saw that it was a love poem because i often describe scotland as a love poem because that's how it feels and it feels for me my relationship with scotland is very much like that where i feel kind of um um constantly having to um i don't quite know how to explain it but you know having to fight that kind of amnesia about our own role in in slavery or colonialism or having to even just to kind of acknowledge the fact that there is racism in this country and it sometimes feels like you're having to constantly just even just to kind of get people to admit that small little bit of reality <laughs> so um i think yeah so i think it came from all of that um and and it is and i think loving somebody is full of of um all of those push and pulls isn't it really you know loving and i think you're you're, you're the, the, when you have a complicated relationship with parents even more so but i think i think i am probably quite interested in the in the difficulties and the that those moments of um contradiction as you said yeah so and there's that thing of a writer so if you it, it's a gift i think you know we often talk about you know you often talk about being mixed race or you talk about being color and it feels like you have to sort of dredge up the trauma and talk about it in that way but there's such joy in it and there's such richness and and a kind of abundance and a multitude and i think that you know it gives and I'm, I'm really kind of after doing this piece which obviously i was in the grief and the rage around this i'm actually really at a place where i want to talk about the actual gifts of of having a legacy of epic love stories and amazing journeys around the world i mean you know what what a gift that is to be a to to have you know as part of your inheritance and move that forward so yeah i i am yeah. i'm with you and all of that <laughs> so. fantastic well that was a wonderful wonderful first set and gave us lots to think about lots and lots to think about um really also about about the issue of loyalty and fidelity and, and where we where we find ourselves when we find our footsteps on our road. So at this point, it'd be great to, to welcome Nadine back into the Zoom room with us. <laughs> that was Hi beautiful, there. Hannah. Oh, thanks, Nadine. And you? Yeah, yeah, I think you're a lovely um, combination. And it's interesting that you both met through Women's Aid and you, you did work together in that, in that context and that you're, you're, you're both st strongly kind of resist the, the notion of victimhood so much so that you don't necessarily talk about it in that way is that because you find that the minute somebody has something like that they box you in and it's really difficult to get out oh that's a big question jackie <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know how you feel about that nadine um i mean nadine, your work's been a lot more rooted in that than um yeah no i'll let you answer that nadine i'll just pass that one to you you know, I think with a, with anything where someone takes a word and puts it on you with with any of those words, for me, it's always it's actually important to define things for yourself. You know, um, and I think that across those many and multitudes of words, for me, that self definition and and the power to choose your own language um, and tell your own story in your own way with your own own words is is really important. Um, so I wrote this poem about my um, great grandmother who I could find very little of her in the records but I know her in the recipes passed down and it's from a series called Pantoums for My Mixed Race Matriarchs for AMB of Salt River, Cape Town. Over the pot 
I stir smoke enough for the ancestors to wake. Recipe passed down from my great grandmother to me. I know her only in this shared taste. I mirror her hands at the stove for days. Repetitions becoming the frame. Recipe passed down from my great grandmother to me. I wonder how many generations we have been mixed race. I mirror her hands at the stove for days, repetitions becoming refrain. Only in glimpses do I catch her face. I wonder how many generations we have been mixed race, ink thrown like spices deepening on the page. Only in glimpses do I catch her face. I bite my tongue, salt river stays. Ink thrown like spices deepening on the page. Over the pot, I stir smoke enough for the ancestors to wake. I bite my tongue, salt river stays. I know her only in this shared taste. So being um, back in a place of heritage and connection um, was really, was really powerful for me and being able to read that poem for the first time in Cape Town on Cape Tonian soil um, where my great grandmother had come from and where her, her family line was for centuries was wonderful and then I also think about the different ways that you can connect to somebody not just through recipe you know not just through memory but by what they live on and what they pass on to us so I'm going to read a poem now from let me tell you this um, which is about my grandmother and I call her my time traveller so it's about the the journey with time that she made um, due to Alzheimer's but also about the connections that I feel to her with the textile heritage that she passed on and passed down so this is threads at first we thought it wasn't as bad as all that everyone forgets with age and my grandmother always did have a taste for the dramatic. But now, over telephone static, your voice fades as fast as your memory. Threads of who you were offered to me. Thin as loose cotton, stray from the weave and spiralled on your overcoat. Our conversations are limited. I can't ask you what you did yesterday or even this morning. So instead, I look for something to bind whatever you are able to bring to mind. I loop it like ribbon around the time between your thoughts arriving and then leaving again. Today, that talk is dressmaking, which is somehow also your mother. And the sense that you think I'm your daughter, I wait for you to call me by her name. And I don't know how to dress make, but if I could, I would sew a quilt with patches of the way the women in my mother's family all wear the same face, and I don't. Something in my lips has been unstitched from this pattern of Collins women, or is it Hinton or Udall or Emery? Maiden names made unchained and hidden in the seams. The author who could rewrite this invisibility, my grandmother. Instead, she is busy discovering a secret no one else knows, how to return to youth, how to bring the dead back to life, how to conquer time, until it is me who was left behind, gathering frayed ends, trying to follow the chalk of her line as the present slips so far ahead the moth bit and past is all that we have left to see. And me, trying to use my words like stitches, afraid that without them we'll both be lost. And all I'll have is memories and cloth and the itch of wool against my skin that you once held and shaped. Now resting gently on my frame, your needles clicking, your hands precise, your voice reminding me how to hold my tension, how to position my bias across the line, how to make something beautiful, something useful from tangled yarn and threads. Everywhere I look, I find things I have inherited. 
and perhaps I'll gather them too. Perhaps I've already begun to unspool and make my journey through time. Maybe there I'll meet your fingers and join your thumb with mine. Measure the distance as if it was a single bolt across which our two hands now span. A poem for your thoughts and it a jumper made in the same way. Threads meeting threads, meeting threads, meeting threads. Picking up where we left off. That was fantastic. I really loved the, the interweaving of all, all of that threads and the threads of memory and the idea of the, the lost memory and of the idea of living or trying to live right inside the moment, which is the best way really um, to deal with um, dementia beautifully, is to live beautifully inside the moment and not too much to worry about what's been remembered or what's been forgotten, um, don't you think? Yeah, no, I, I think it's um, the ultimate, I guess, in being in that moment, like you say, but for me also just meant a lot to capture the textile heritage that I associate with her in the poem as well. Yeah, I'm going to read a poem just really to, to go with that because every week I try and pick a, a poem that, that is a kind of a call and response, a response to something that someone's read. I thought I'd read this poem, The Wood Father, as really a response to, to all of us um, and all of our thinking that we've been doing around ancestry. When I traced my birth father, I found him to be a leading ethnobotanist from Nigeria, and that seemed uh, fascinating to me. So this is called The Wood Father. His hands were bark, his hair was leaves. He stood tall and dark amongst the trees. His arms waved in the wind, hello, goodbye. Words fluttered like birds from his eaves. I couldn't tell if he loved me or not. His eyes were darker than his barking hands, nor if he wanted to meet again in the dark forest in the old red land. His daughters, his sons, he would not name or speak of them or anything they'd done. And when the rain fell down in the rainy season, he got up and moved across the forest floor like a tree from Shakespeare, dragging his roots all the way from Abuja to Inugu in the dead of night into the red of dawn. Before he left, he gave me a name, Yumoja, and I didn't point a twig or a finger. I was torn as to which poem to read there because it's interesting when you read people's work, you're often, you're often responding in your own way to, to their work um, in all sorts of different ways because really, well, part of the idea of this program is a kind of a, a call and response from, from form to form, a kind of conversation within the form. And I was really struck by hearing both of you tonight by just how interested you both are in form and how you can say actually difficult things because you've got tight control over the form and over what you're saying. That last one that you read, Nadine, was you use pantoums and, and repetition. And in, in your work, Hannah, your work always kind of has beautiful scansion. You must give so much thought to every, every line. You could almost hold the line up and it would balance itself on the end of each hand. It wouldn't sag in the middle just because of how you, how you manage your, your lines and your rhythm. So I'm just really interested in in that and form. So maybe a, a quick wee word about form before we go on to, to Hannah's next set. And Suzanne can chip in with form too because she, she, she's a maestro of form too. And you're really, <laughs> really fascinated, aren't you, Suzanne, with when you're singing a song to try and catch your version of that form, but it is form that you're grappling with all the time. Yes, all the time. And um, it's almost like the space within and pictures and all the senses. It's like Shakespeare really, isn't it? It's the that vowel sound, the ah, and the open heart, um, just to let that sound flow and that you become a vehicle for the words. So you're almost falling in love with the words when you hear them each time as well. You know, it's like, it's, it's like hearing something for the first time and it's not about the ego or how the sound of the, how the sound of the voice, it's where the, the words and indeed when you're singing the melody takes you. Yeah. I think it's like 
I thought that was really, really insightful what you said about the idea that you say difficult things within a form. I think, and I probably only thought about this just now, but it did make me think that it's something about controlling your world or creating something safe for you to say things. And, I, you know, it is, and like you were saying, Suzanne, it's like, it's finding the vehicle, isn't it? To say, yes. to, to kind of, like maybe the safe boat or the safe, you know, like it, it feels like that actually. It feels that you're, you're, you're looking for something that, that allows you to have control of, yes. of, of, you know, and, and so maybe, uh, and that's not the best response you'll ever get to the question about, tell me about form, but that's probably as best as I can give you. <laughs> and as, as an interpreter, because yeah. that's the thing I think as I'm finding my own voice and that's what's been really fascinating about this um, program for one, because I'm with writers and that I've been discovering my own voice in terms of what I see, you know, through, writing myself a secret writer <laughs> and that's been an incredible journey and how that actually then frees you so much it's like Joni Mitchell says that when she sings a song which I love that if there's something that someone can take from it that's what's important you know she said it's not even about me or again the voice she said it's just about that here's this story and if someone can take something from it then that's enough yeah, I think when you get it right, it feels like a gift, doesn't it? That you're handing yes. it to someone. Yes. I think very yes. strong, and not to be not to um, be creepy, but with Jackie, th when I discovered Jackie Kay's poetry in Word Power Books when I was about, I can't even remember. I remember feeling like I'd been given a gift, like I'd been given mm -hmm. a doorway into uh, into my own self, even though yes. it was coming from you it felt like you were reaching out and I think that's when it is that isn't it that passing on a gift and um maybe that's what form is maybe it's just just the the gift the the box the package ah, I love that well that's <laughs> I'm gonna get, I, I love it, it. I love it time. too <laughs> <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> yeah. <Hi>. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember when I first started writing poems it was to give um, as little as little gifts, and uh, and then recently, you know, when my my son was uh, injured, I, I wrote um, a poem, a banquet for the boys. I actually sent them a banquet, but I I also wrote a poem to go with it, and that that kind of reminded me of the of of how I first started writing, which was to write little presents, really, for for my mum on Mother's Day or for my friends. And I remember if Alice and Todd I used to read my poems to Alice and Todd in the school lunch hour. If Alice and Todd cried, I thought. <laughs> if Alice and Todd didn't cry, I wasn't. I wasn't so sure. But um, but I I think that 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 idea of I mean, thanks so much for saying that, Hannah. That's that's lovely. That's uh, tickled me brown. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but but um, I think that the, the idea of 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 giving something is really what, what was one of the ideas behind this this series to actually find a way to give people something to give them some sort of comfort some sort of solace keep them company keep you company i should say to to my viewers because you are out there we believe you to be there we're not deluded you are there and um, so the idea was really to try and find a way to keep you company um from our living rooms to yours and, and so far we've been had, having the most extraordinary um response to this this gift of keeping company in these times that are very solitary and isolated, but people have found ways of being differently intimate. And that's um, it's a fantastic thing to do with the forum. This is a different kind of intimacy to be with you all and to see into your houses. I've never been to your house before. So I'm getting to do you're things getting, that I would not very, very, or, you know, controlled look at my house, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting the form. I'm getting your yes. house on the <laughs> form. <Sitting behind here. laughs> I wonder if you could read us our next, your next set. And I said, yeah. I'm dying um, to hear more. Okay. Um, right, I'm just going so I can see it. I feel like I've got into darkness now, but we'll just have to... Uh, fine. Okay, this is called Flying Bats. I was invited here, I'm sure I was, to read my poetry. That's what the email said. I've been writing a lot about trees. Oh, this, this nest I found in a hedge. Blue wee eggs. A starling, was it? I well, I was invited. That's what it said. Tonight, for all you lovely folk, I'm unpacking my poetry suitcase. Ta-da! The traveling poetry salesman. That'll be me. Roll up, roll up, going, going, going. 
and they say after they say i love how you spoke about found nests as a metaphor for immigration truth is i've always been here i was just writing about this wood at the back of my house about a nest i found how at night i duck the bats as if they might fly into my hair, even though I know I duck, even though I know they know the place just as well as I, they just as well as they know I know the place. Still, I duck. Um, so I'm gonna read another poem um, called The Specials. Um, I, I wrote this poem for my son, um and i suppose it's you know it was about a specific incident when when my son came home from school after after um being kind of racially abused but it's also really about that desire we have as parents to hold our children close and create a world that's safe for them so this is called the specials the specials it's written on your face and whilst I can still read you, let me take it for you. Take it out and leave it on the step. Here we'll be home. We will open the windows and scream it for the neighbours to keep. Or the rooks. I let them call it out. It's staying in your boots, son. And whilst I still can, let me scrub them clean, soak it up, screw it up, rip it up, leave it on the front step for the foxes. We'll be home here. We'll dance to the specials in our sock feet before we open the back door and yell it to the sky. We'll go strong here, here, sweet boy. It's shockwaves just, see? We will dance to the specials in our sock feet in the half light, leave our dirty boots fallen by the back door. It's written on your face. And whilst I can still read it, let me whisper our stories so they build to myths and legends for you to emerge from whole, strong, known. And let's curse through the letterbox before sticking it shut with masking tape and let's grow strong, son, dancing to the specials in sock feet in our own half light. And I'm going to finish um, my set reading a poem about poetry. Um, I think it speaks a little bit about what we were talking about earlier. This is called Poetry and Me. Before I was told about you, I knew you. We would keep each other company with I spy on long car journeys. I found you jumping puddles as wide as oceans, comparing Nana at her window to a setting sun or dissolve in sugar, or to my last Rolo. Later, they try to make you a stranger when they rip the flesh from your bones. But you came in for me, came back as a, all right, hiya, a yell, a sigh, from the bottom of the well, or was it a dark cave, or that forbidden corner of the back green? We carry each other now, like soldiers carry each other off the battlefield in films, like revolutionaries retreat from the barricades in songs, like children come when dinner is called. I haul you on my back and you carry me on your arms, sorry, you carry me in your arms. You offer me ways, veils to dance with, spittoons and bin bags, platform shoes. Poetry and I, poetry and me, is all this, I think another stuff too, sometimes carrying me in its arms, sometimes hauled up on my back. Oh, that was, that was really fantastic. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, and you just get such a sense um, from, from that poem and from the, the one before it um, to, your, to your son of all of the different ways in which poetry can be a healing balm can be our friend, can be um, 
our, our, our other, the other part of the conversation, really. Um, so, and that's, um, I think, what we've hopefully given people tonight, some other part of the conversation. Um, so I think you're, you're, you're right so interestingly about so many different themes. And I love the, the one that you started with, the, the idea about the nest. No, <laughs> it's just a nest. <laughs> I'm writing about a nest. And, and, and the idea that, that, um, that people can be forever looking into um, the ways in which we might use metaphor. And sometimes you, you actually want to say, no, I remember going to a school once in, in Bristol where they were studying the adoption papers and they said to me, we've noticed that you use cherry blossom a lot in your poems. It's just to do with the Japanese sign of regeneration. And I said, no, it's the only tree I know the name of. <laughs> they were all a bit disappointed. <laughs> that day I'd forgotten my own book and I, yeah. I had to borrow the teacher's book. Yeah, no, it's also a thing in that poem as well, is that I did write that going, it was just the nest. And then I started going, oh, maybe maybe I am saying something about the nest. It's like, I didn't think I was, but now that you point it out as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, why should we know what our poems are about, really? <laughs> so. Exactly. It's really up to other people to decide that for us. Yeah. Well, I'd love to invite Nadine and, and Nadine and Suzanne back into the, into the room. Hey, Nadine. Hi. Hey. Do you mind just being called Nadine in its own, or do you like being called Nadine Aisha? I like both. I like both. Awesome. Just as well, actually, so I'm a bit late asking that question. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, Suzanne's going to take us uh, out tonight with a really wonderful song, uh, You've Got a Friend. Um, you two are friends of each other's, Nadine and Hannah. Suzanne and I are, are, are friends that have gone back um, well, 30 years, we're as old as my son, <laughs> our friendship is, <laughs> we're as old as my son in friendship years, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's really a, a wonderful thing, friendship, we can't really underestimate it, and we've made two new friends tonight, haven't we, Suzanne, in this wonderful program, and hopefully out there, we've made a friend of you. Um, thank you very much to all of the people that support this um, program and make it happen to the National Theatre of Scotland. We're hosting it right now, the Edinburgh International Book Festival, to Home Manchester, and to the School of Arts and Media at the University of Salford. We're going to have both of Nadine and Hannah tell us what their favourite bookshops are, and then after that, Suzanne is going to take it away. Nadine, tell us your, your favourite bookshop. I, classic Gemini, I chose two. I chose the Lighthouse Bookshop and the Portobello Bookshop. Fantastic. And what about you, Hannah? I, I don't know if this is classic Sagittarius and Dean, but I also chose two. In fact, I could probably put Lighthouse Books or Word Power, as I still call it. Um, and the, my favourite, my two books, sorry, are Barter Books and Alnick. Is it Anik? Barter Books, you know, in the train station. And the other, my favourite, is Main Street Book or Main Street Trading Bookshop in St Boswell's. So they're two destination bookshops, I think. So yeah, yeah. Worth, worth a visit. Well, well Main, Main Street in St Boswell's is one of my all time favourite book bookshops. I think it's absolutely fantastic bookshop. They just get so much right. Yeah, and those do. women. Run and the little, they have a little a nook for children. Uh, under yeah. the stairs they have a bit under the stairs That's where children can go in and read books and it's, it's amazing it's just, yeah it's I, would go, I would go there just for the bookshop I would go to the place just for the bookshop which you know is, is amazing I drive all the way from somewhere to there to that well, bookshop next time, Jack, um, pick me up on the way and we'll go and have to pick you up <laughs> we can go we can go there but anyway thank you very much and thank you very much to you at home for joining us we're going to play out with the wonderful Ms. Suzanne Bonner singing You've Got a Friend. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand when nothing nothing is going your way close your eyes think of me and i will be 
It's been absolutely fantastic, really wonderful. What a, what a great version of that song. Wasn't that fantastic? Beautiful. We're, didn't we all love it? Really, really beautiful. Good. Really fantastic. Well, I would like to just say a huge, huge big thank you to Suzanne Bonner for coming on Maka to Maka, to Nadine, Aisha, Jasset for coming on Maka to Maka, and to Hannah Lavery. Thank you very much for being my guest tonight. It's been <laughs> fantastic. You were a last minute change to the schedule and you've done absolutely brilliantly well. We were going to be having Adjoa Ando on this week and Adjoa will be joining us another week. So please stay with us and see you next week. Bye-bye.